Listening Section Directions This test measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separate timed parts. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some question on it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Notes will not be scored. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear, but not see. Part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If question is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next, then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. In an actual test or during this practice test, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering questions. Click on Continue at any time to dismiss these directions. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor on the topic of experimental theater and the ideas of Polish theater director Jerzy Grotowski. Good morning, professor. I wanted to discuss my research on the experimental theater techniques of Jerzy Grotowski. Ah, uh, yes. Grotowski's work is quite fascinating, though not well known to many. What particularly intrigues you about his approaches? While I'm really interested in his concept of poor theater, the idea of stripping away all the technical elements like elaborate sets, costumes and lighting, and focusing solely on the raw physical expression of the actors. I see. Grotowski believed that this poor theater could create a more direct, intimate connection between the performers and the audience. His productions were known to be quite confrontational and immersive. Exactly. I'd like to try incorporating some of those principles into my class presentation. I thought it would be a good way to really bring Grotowski's theories to life for my classmates. That's an excellent idea. Grotowski's work was all about challenging the traditional boundaries between performers and audience. Actively involving the audience can be a powerful way to demonstrate his approach. Yes, I'm especially interested in exploring his later phase, where he was focused on the relationship between the actors and the spectators. I think a live performance element could really showcase that. I agree. Just be mindful that Grotowski's techniques require a great deal of physical and emotional preparation. You may want to allot some extra time in class to properly introduce and contextualize the performance. Good point. I'll make sure to strike a balance between the written component and the live demonstration. I want to make sure I do justice to Grotowski's complex and avant-garde ideas. Well, I'm excited to see how you bring this to life in your presentation. Grotowski's work is so layered and thought-provoking. I'm sure your classmates will find it a fascinating and illuminating experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your guidance, Professor. I'm really looking forward to delving deeper into Grotowski's revolutionary theatrical theories. My pleasure. Best of luck with your research and presentation. I'm confident. Why does the student visit the professor? What does the professor warn the student about regarding Grotowski's techniques?
What can be inferred about the student's plan for her presentation? What does the professor mean when he says, Grotowski's work is all about challenging the traditional boundaries between performers and audience. How does the professor organize his advice to the student about her presentation? Listen to part of a lecture on the evolution of minerals in a geology class. Since the formation of Earth, around four and a half billion years ago, the number of minerals present has increased dramatically. We've gone from a few dozen relatively simple minerals in the early stages to over four, three hundred different types of minerals that we can identify today, many of which are quite complex. A fundamental question in geology is how all these new minerals came into existence. Recent studies have turned to biology to try to explain this process. Now, much of biology is examined through the lens of evolution. The theory of evolution suggests that as environments change, organisms with characteristics that allow them to adapt successfully will thrive and reproduce. As environments become more complex over time, these adaptations and variations become the basis for even more diverse and complex forms of life. So we've gone from fewer, simpler, and more similar forms of life billions of years ago to the incredible diversity and complexity we see today. Some geologists now want to apply this same concept of evolution to explain the diversity of minerals as well. The conditions that minerals experience, such as temperature, pressure, and chemical surroundings, are not constant, but rather change, often in cycles, over time. As these conditions change, Minerals can break down and their atoms can recombine into totally new compounds, a process known as mineral evolution. Now, minerals are not alive, so this is not evolution in the same sense as with living organisms. However, there are some parallels. Living organisms not only adapt to their environment but also affect it, changing the environment in which other organisms may then develop. In a similar way, each new mineral also enriches the chemical environment from which even more complex new minerals may form in the future. What's truly fascinating about mineral evolution is the way minerals appear to co-evolve with living organisms. Around a billion years after Earth's formation, we first see evidence of life, primitive, single-celled microbes. Over time, these microbes had a profound effect, with huge numbers of them producing food through photosynthesis and releasing enormous amounts of oxygen. This oxygen then interacted with the atoms of existing minerals, creating new minerals like rust from iron, and reacting with a wide range of different metals. Living organisms rely on minerals, but they also excrete certain minerals as waste products, including what we call biominerals, minerals that form with the help of biological life. We can see geologic evidence of biomineral production in the form of stromatolites, which are fossils of the waste from ancient microbial mats. These mats interacted with minerals in the environment and left behind new compounds as waste products, including biominerals like carbonates, phosphates, and silica. 
Professor, how do we know that these biominerals are the result of biological processes rather than just purely geological processes? That's a great question. The study of stromatolites has provided important clues. When we've grown microbial mats in the laboratory, over time they too have produced some of the same minerals found in stromatolites. This suggests that the biominerals found in the fossil record are indeed the result of biological processes, not just geological processes alone. However, you make a good point that we need to be careful about assuming that any particular mineral found on another planet must have been produced by the same biological processes that formed similar minerals here on Earth. We're still working to fully understand the complex interactions between life and the mineral world, and there may be other geological processes at play as well. Ongoing research in this area will help us piece together a more complete picture. You raise an excellent point. We have to be cautious about making assumptions when it comes to interpreting the presence of certain minerals on other planetary bodies. Just because we find a mineral on Mars or Venus that is similar to one produced by biological processes here on Earth, we can't automatically conclude that the same biological processes must have occurred there. There may well be other geological mechanisms at work that could generate those same minerals through non-biological means. One of the key challenges in astrobiology is trying to distinguish biosignatures, signs of past or present life, from abiotic, or non-biological, geological processes. The concept of mineral evolution is intriguing because it suggests there may be ways we can use the mineral record to infer the existence of life. But we need to thoroughly understand the range of geological processes that can produce different minerals before we can reliably make those kinds of interpretations. Ongoing research into mineral organism interactions here on Earth will be critical for building that knowledge base. As we learn more about how microbes, for example, can influence mineral formation and transformation, we'll be better equipped to recognize potential biosignatures elsewhere in the solar system. It's an exciting area of study that has important implications for our search for life beyond Earth. You're absolutely right that we need to be cautious about making overly simplistic connections between minerals found on other planets and the biological processes that produce similar minerals here on Earth. The CO evolution of minerals and life is a complex and nuanced topic that we're still working to fully understand. One important consideration is that the environmental conditions on other planetary bodies may be radically different from what we experience here. The temperature, pressure, atmospheric composition, and other factors could allow for a wide range of abiotic, geological processes to generate mineral assemblages that resemble those associated with biological activity on Earth. We have to be careful not to jump to conclusions without thoroughly investigating the full range of potential formation mechanisms. That said, the study of mineral evolution on Earth does provide an important framework and set of hypotheses that we can use to guide our exploration of the potential for life elsewhere. If we do find certain biosignature minerals on another planet, it may warrant further investigation to see if there are any other lines of evidence, geological or otherwise, that could support a biological origin. But you're right that we can't automatically make that leap. We have to be rigorous in our analysis and keep an open mind to alternative explanations. Ongoing laboratory ex What is the main topic of the lecture? According to the professor, how do microbes affect mineral formation? Why does the professor say? 
we have to be cautious about making assumptions. What can be inferred about the role of stromatolites in the study of biominerals? How does the professor organize the information about mineral evolution and biological evolution? Match each concept with its correct explanation based on the lecture. Listen to part of a lecture on the importance of biodiversity in an environmental science class. Biodiversity is the variety of living species on our planet, and it is crucial for the health and stability of ecosystems. Each species plays a unique role in maintaining the delicate balance of nature. Today, we'll explore the significance of biodiversity and why it's essential to protect it. One of the primary reasons biodiversity is so important is its role in ecosystem functioning. Different species have evolved to fill specific niches, and they rely on one another to maintain the overall health of the ecosystem. For example, plants provide food and shelter for many animals, while animals, in turn, help with seed dispersal and pollination. This intricate web of interactions keeps the ecosystem thriving. Professor, can you give us an example of how the loss of a single species can impact an entire ecosystem? Excellent question. Let's take the example of the wolves in Yellowstone National Park. When wolves were hunted to near extinction in the early 20th century, the elk population exploded. Without the natural predator to keep their numbers in check, the elk overgrazed the vegetation, leading to a decline in the diversity of plant species. This had a cascading effect on the entire ecosystem, affecting the habitats of other animals, from small rodents to bears. When the wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone in the 1990s, the ecosystem began to recover. The elk population was brought under control, allowing the vegetation to flourish once again. This, in turn, benefited a wide range of other species, from songbirds to beavers. This example demonstrates how the loss of a single species can have far-reaching consequences for an entire ecosystem. Biodiversity also plays a crucial role in providing ecosystem services that are essential for human well-being. For instance, wetlands act as natural water filters, purifying our drinking water. Forests help regulate our climate by absorbing carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. And many of our most important medicines are derived from plants and microorganisms found in nature. Losing this biodiversity would have profound implications for our own survival and quality of life. Unfortunately, human activities such as habitat destruction, pollution, and climate change are putting immense pressure on the world's biodiversity. Species are going extinct at an alarming rate, and many more are threatened with extinction. 
it's crucial that we take immediate action to protect and preserve the rich tapestry of life on our planet. By understanding the importance of biodiversity and the interconnectedness of ecosystems, we can make more informed decisions about how we use and manage our natural resources. It's not just about protecting individual species. It's about safeguarding the delicate balance that sustains all life on Earth. What is the main topic of the lecture? According to the professor, what role do wetlands play in providing ecosystem services? What does the professor mean when he says, Each species plays a unique role in maintaining the delicate balance of nature. What can be inferred about the professor's view on biodiversity loss? How does the professor organize the information about the impact of losing a single species on an ecosystem? Fill in the table with the correct information about ecosystem services mentioned in the lecture. Listen to a conversation between a student and a staff member at the university's Career Services Center. One of my sociology professors suggested that I come to the Career Services Center and speak with you. She mentioned that a career fair is coming up soon, where I could talk to different companies about a potential summer job. Absolutely. We have our annual classroom to corporation career fair coming up. It's our biggest event, with over 100 companies represented and they even conduct interviews right here on campus. Great! What kinds of companies will be there? This year, we'll have representatives from many of the major technology companies in the area. Oh, I'm not sure how helpful that will be for me, since I'm a sociology major. Not to worry. Sociology students often find great opportunities in areas like marketing, administration, 
and human resources at these tech companies? Well, I'm mainly interested in working in human services and with people. In that case, you might be better suited for our smaller, upcoming fair, which features more public service organizations and smaller companies. Yes, I think that's the one my professor was referring to. Okay. Have you attended a career fair like this before? No, this will be my first time. No problem. You don't need to register, but I do recommend that you come prepared. Dress professionally and bring copies of your resume. Resume? Do I really need that? It's not a requirement, but having a resume can help you stand out among the other job seekers. Many students and community members attend these fairs, so anything you can do to appear more professional will be helpful. The thing is, I've never written a resume before. No worries. Our website has great resources on how to create a resume. You can also make an appointment to have someone in the Career Services Center review it with you. Okay. So I really do need to have a resume to get a summer job? It's a good idea. What is the main topic of the conversation? What does the staff member say about the types of companies at the career fair? What does the staff member mean when they say, Having a resume can help you stand out among the other job seekers. What can be inferred about the student's preparation for the career fair? How does the staff member organize the information about preparing for the career fair? Listen to part of a lecture on the impact of industrialization on the environment in an environmental studies class. In the 19th century, the rapid industrialization and technological advancements that occurred in the United States had a profound impact on the natural environment. One of the key innovations that transformed society during this period was the development of the railroad. The railroad, or iron horse as it was often called, allowed people and goods to be transported across the country at unprecedented speeds. This unlocked new experiences of time and space for people. Thoreau, the famous American author, both praised and critiqued the influence of the railroad in his renowned work, Walden. 
While Thoreau acknowledged the practical benefits of the railroad in delivering essential goods and improving human life, he also expressed concerns about how it distorted people's experiences of the natural world. As the trains whizzed by, the trees, wildlife, and landscapes just seemed to blur past, disconnecting people from their surroundings. Thoreau worried that this detachment from nature would lead people to lose their appreciation for the environment. Additionally, Thoreau was concerned that the railroad was becoming an institution that was regulating and shaping the country. He feared that people were beginning to conform to the railroad's timetable, letting this mechanical device govern their lives. Thoreau extended this critique to other technological innovations of the time, like the penny press and popular literature. He worried that people were no longer thinking for themselves and were uncritically accepting the information and entertainment that these new technologies provided. So what can we learn from Thoreau's perspective on the railroad and other technologies of his era? I think it's a valuable lesson for how we approach new inventions and advancements in our own time. When a new computer, phone, or gadget emerges, there's often a tendency to feel that we need to have it without fully considering the potential consequences or trade-offs. Thoreau's critique encourages us to be more thoughtful and discerning about the impact of technology on our lives and our relationship with the natural world. Class, can anyone provide a contemporary example that illustrates this point? Sarah, what do you think? Well, I can think of how the rise of social media and smartphones has fundamentally changed the way people interact with each other and with their surroundings. Many people, myself included, find themselves constantly glued to their screens, scrolling through posts and notifications. This can distract us from being fully present in the moment and appreciating the world around us, much like how Thoreau described the railroad disrupting people's connection to nature. It's an example of how new technology can have unintended consequences that are worth reflecting on. That's an excellent point, Sarah. The way that digital technologies have reshaped our daily lives and our relationship with the environment is a very relevant modern parallel to consider in light of Thoreau's insights. Just as the railroad transformed society in the 19th century, smartphones and social media have radically altered how we experience the world in the 21st century. It's important that we approach these new technologies with the same level of critical analysis that Thoreau applied to the railroad, considering both the benefits and the potential drawbacks. What is the main topic of the lecture? What does the professor state about the railroad's impact on people's experience of the natural world? What does the professor imply when he says, What can we learn from Thoreau's perspective on the railroad and other technologies of his era? What can be inferred about the professor's view on modern technologies like smartphones and social media?
How does the professor organize the lecture? What can be implied about the relationship between technological advancements and people's lifestyle changes?